Ганна, вам треба обрати канал мови. А який обрати? Будь-який. Який ви хочете почути. Який, ну, або англійська, або українська. Є англійська. Англійська, зараз чуєте? А перемкніть, будь ласка, на українську. Дивно, дуже дивно. Піські вас чую. От ще раз. Тепер знову не чую. А зараз чути мене? Чути зараз. Але це по англійському каналу чути. So good morning everybody in Kyiv, in Tokyo. We start our weekly online discussion marathon, Ukrainian-Japanese. This online marathon, as we call it in our center, is a sort of follow-up of Ukrainian-Japanese uh, forum, which was in Kiev on February 16th, attended by Ukrainian and Japanese governmental officials and experts. During the forum, we've outlined several topics that were not discussed at great length, but were causing a lot of interest in terms of uh, discussion, or this is a separate discussion. That's why we decided to make a follow-up on those topics that we didn't cover enough during the forum. And one of such topics is related to Japanese-American uh, relations, J Japan America Alliance. It's it has a lot of interest in, among people because for both Ukraine and Japan and for the U.S., the U.S. are the security partner number one. For Japan, they are a, an ally. For Ukraine, is still a partner, but Ukraine would also very much like to have the U.S. as a full-fledged security ally for us. That's why we would like very much to hear from our Japanese colleagues and to talk with Ukrainian experts what lessons can be learned from Japanese-American alliance for Ukraine. To what extent Japan feels safe in all these changes in the security aspects in the region, security environment, to what extent they see their alliance with the U.S. as relevant? Is it worth for Ukraine to build further relations with the U.S., bilateral security agreements, or is it better to move towards NATO? and to focus on that. Specifically for this forum, we asked one of our panelists, and for this discussion in particular, we asked one of our panelists in the forum, Bonji O'Hara, to write an analytical comment and to depict what's the Japanese-American alliance today what are the nuances? What are the caveats? What are the expectations from the Biden administration? And to begin, I would like to give floor to Mr. Bonji. I see he is online with us. It's very, we're, it's very pleasant to see you again, Dr. O'Hara. I'll buy, I'll be it virtually, but still, hopefully, we'll see each other uh, together in. Tokyo or Kiev someday. And uh, within five minutes, we would like you to present the main 
uh, essence of your comment so that we can later discuss it. Thank you. Bonji Ohara, Senior Scientific uh, um, Advisor to Thank you very Sakawa much. Foundation. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. The, uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to the uh, uh, great opportunity to uh, discuss with the uh, Ukraine friend. And uh, my, I'd like to uh, introduce my idea. And uh, uh, Japan-U.S. alliance is the uh, base and or the uh, fundamental condition of Japanese uh, diplomacy and security policy. The uh, key alliance uh, is not such easy. The, uh, Japanese government and the, uh, Japanese military officials were always uh, making effort to uh, keep the alliance. The uh, basis of the uh, 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 alliance must be the uh, information sharing or the uh, uh, before information sharing, the uh, uh, share the uh, situation awareness or uh, situation uh, perception about situation. So the uh, uh, Japan has the, uh, its own national interest. Uh, it is not completely same from the uh, US uh, national interest. So uh, Japan uh, always uh, uh, make effort to uh, uh, share the uh, perception and uh, how to uh, deal with the issues in the uh, uh, Indo-Pacific region. Yeah, of course, the uh, Japan is providing the uh, uh, naval base or the uh, uh, Air Force bases uh, to the United States, US military forces. But uh, Japan uh, has the uh, good condition for the uh, US military forces because uh, Japan is very stable uh, politically. And also the uh, Japan has the uh, high technology to uh, provide the uh, uh, high end of, uh, uh, what I say, uh, maintenance of the uh, ships uh, or the, uh, uh, and the aircraft. And also can provide the uh, high quality of the uh, waters and the food and the fuel or to the uh, uh, ships and the uh, aircraft. So the... Uh, and also the uh, uh, Japanese base has the uh, uh, geopolitical, uh, sorry, uh, geographical uh, importance for the uh, United States. Because uh, when United States uh, want to send its troops to the uh, Indian Ocean or the uh, Middle East, then uh, United States uh, does not have uh, enough uh, naval bases. Uh, if the uh, United States does not have bases in Japan, then uh, US uh, Navy fleet or aircraft uh, need to uh, uh, make long uh, navigation from Hawaii to the uh, 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 Diego Garcia. Uh, so the uh, uh, Basis in Japan is very important uh, geographically and also geopolitically. But uh, bases uh, are not enough uh, to uh, make contribution to the uh, US security policies. So the uh, Japan uh, and uh, basically the uh, must be uh, in charge of the uh, defense of Japan itself. Uh, United States has the uh, uh, rule to uh, uh, what I say, support the uh, defense of other countries. Uh, the rule is the uh, condition is the, uh, uh, the country is making effort to uh, defend itself. Then uh, US uh, will support the country. So the uh, Japan uh, was always uh, making effort to uh, defend Japan itself by itself. And, uh, but uh, Japan-US alliance uh, has the uh, implication uh, in the uh, each uh, period in the past. And uh, in the uh, uh, 
U.S. Soviet Cold War era, then uh, it was simple. But uh, after the uh, uh, end of Cold War, then uh, implication of the Japan-U.S. alliance uh, was started uh, started uh, be changing. Then uh, now the uh, uh, Japan and the United States are uh, considering the uh, uh, what I say. Uh, what is the uh, implication of the uh, uh, alliance uh, in this new era? Uh, in new era is the uh, after U.S. Uh, recognized that the uh, 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 revival of the uh, uh, rivality between major powers. Uh, major powers means the United States and China now. So the uh, we are still discussing about the uh, cooperation and about the implication of the uh, US-Japan alliance. But uh, and the one more condition is the uh, hybrid warfare. Uh, we cannot separate the uh, wartime and the peacetime such clearly. Uh, Japan uh, consider the uh, gray zone, but the uh, gray zone is also not such simple. And uh, we must uh, cooperate uh, from the uh, peacetime. So the uh, now we are uh, Japan uh, started uh, making effort uh, and established the uh, uh, cyber uh, unit in the uh, JSTF and also the uh, uh, space operation command uh, also established a space operation unit was also established in the uh, JSTF. So. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, effort uh, is showing the uh, we have the uh, uh, new frontier uh, of the cooperation uh, in the cyberspace and outer space. Uh, so uh, uh, it does not have the uh, borders. And uh, there are some argument about the uh, sovereignty uh, in the cyberspace. Uh, in these uh, new domains, the, uh, we need to uh, uh, strengthen the uh, cooperation uh, between uh, Japan and the United States. And the uh, US uh, new administration has not yet decided the uh, uh, China policy uh, completely. The, uh, in this uh, period, the uh, Japan uh, must be uh, positive uh, or the active uh, to uh, what I say, uh, try to share the uh, uh, perception with the United States and uh, discuss about the uh, cooperation in a new domain. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, oh Mr. O'Hara, for this overview. I would like to invite to the floor the ambassador of Ukraine in Japan, Sergei Korsunsky. His presence is very relevant in this discussion, not only because he represents Ukraine in Japan for almost six months, as far as I know, but has also worked in the US. He understands the context very well. And Sergei, to you, the question is from the point you started working in Tokyo, to what extent do you think it's possible to, uh, for Ukraine to learn some lessons in the Ukrainian-American alliance? Is there a difference between historic perspective and different classification of threats that are uh, there in Tokyo and Kiev? Because it's not a secret, and on our forum we, can, we have articulated that uh, from Ukrainian participants that for Ukraine, the main existential threat is Russia or the power that occupies Russia at the moment. And Japan is focused on China. So a different classification of uh, threats. Does it make the experience of US and Japan security alliance relevant for us and interesting for you? So your first observations maybe. Or maybe there are some conclusions, ideas in this regard.
thank you. I'm very happy to see you all. And let me start with response to this question with lessons uh, for Ukraine. The main lesson for Ukraine is that the U.S. never will never support any alliance just like that, just as simple. The policy, the U.S. Japanese policy, is determined, and it's very simple. Japan is the key ally of the U.S. in the region, which will get all the possible support. And the fact that in April, uh, Prime Minister Suga will have an official visit to Washington. It's going to be the first foreign uh, governmental head official who will be uh, taken by the, accepted by the new administration is a political decision because earlier there were po British prime ministers who had first attended. But now um, in Tokyo, the state secretary and the minister of defense of that. So there will be two plus two. And it's very important dialogue because after that, the they will go to Korea. And after that, the state secretary goes to Alaska to meet with Chinese and the minister of defense will go to India. So it's all very clear, and uh, you don't have to decipher anything. It's very clear. The U.S. will be very attentive on, on Pacific region, and this Pacific Four summit happened last week. You know, a huge attention um, was there. It will be in the center of the foreign policy of the U.S., not only in the region but in the world, but because for the U.S., existential threat right now is China. Of course, not Russia, because Russia in this regard is just marginal, some kind, kind of marginal power that is the new, new stance, but they don't pose a serious threat. China is a different story. So for us, the experience and the lesson learned is primarily that from Japan, uh, the U.S. will want more from Japan. They will want that the Japan, in terms of military presence, in terms of diplomacy, it's going to be it's more active. It's, it was active anyway. Japan has played anyway the facilitator role and promoter of the multilateral initiatives and free trade and the dialogue. But even more so, the U.S. will want this role to increase. That's on one hand. On the other hand, is that they will want to see multilateral initiatives participated and attended by a bigger number of countries in order to split the responsibility for shared goals. And there will be practical steps. I was very interested to see that online summit. Four countries. Well, it, it happened before, nothing so special, but here suddenly this initiative uh, that as they decided to create the mechanism of alternative supply of vaccines uh, to, from China, the three countries, um, Australia, Japan, and the US will give loans to Asian countries. And they will buy Indian vaccine. It's interesting. It's a direct support of India. And that creates a channel of support for the countries where China is uh, giving the vaccines almost for free because it's China. So we also have to be uh, aware that, yeah, there are problems of Northern territories. There's a problem of Russia. This dialogue will be there, but currently they don't expect any armed conflict with Russia. But uh, Chicago Islands, that causes more and more concern and more and more is written about, in, about that in the press and the politicians speak about that more and more because after the February 1st, when the first the Chinese uh, law entered the force that uh, um, uh, Beachhead can now open fire. And so the, the, will, will other countries will allow their Beachhead open fire. And I'm concerned when I see that uh, China says officially that no, there are, those are our islands. And it's very dangerous because that's a direct way to confrontation. And it's obvious for us all, there's no doubt that J J Japan has sovereign rule over Chicago Islands. And it's important that the US specifically on this, has spoken on this. And they confirmed that Article 5 of Security Alliance 
between the U.S. and Japan covered Senkaku Islands. And that sends a signal to the Ch to Chinese that they're under no condition they will tolerate any attempt to switch the sovereignty of these islands to China. But this confrontation, nobody needed that, and nobody needs it. Nobody understands why it happens, other than the Taiwan context. Because if you scrutinize, it's a very uh, convenient place to, cover, to capture Taiwan. And it's not a good development. And we have to consider that. If we speak about that we are part of the democratic world, if we say that the US are the main security provider for us, and we cannot imagine any other context, then we have to understand that everything related to China is going to be scrutinized by our allies, our partners in the, in the G7, in the G20, and so on and so forth. Because any tech transfer, any cooperation that shifts the balance or can shift the balance of forces in terms of security will be viewed as a very bad thing. And I'm happy to tell you that Japan has uh, valued highly our decision regarding motor siege. During my official meetings at the high level, nobody was hiding that fact. We knew that Japan uh, is concerned about that, and it's great that we decided that. I support the decision. I know what motor siege is, and I know that a big mistake was made at some point with all this story. So I think that we need to strengthen our security dialogue with Japan. It's hugely important. We have experience of fighting Russia, and this factor is there, but at the same time, we have to understand that this discussion in Japan is going on. And it's called Japan, is it local? Is Japan local or is it global? The same about Ukraine. Is Ukraine local or global? Are we somewhere on the outskirts or are we part of the world community? And do we want to be part of the democratic uh, camp that creates our uh, shared future? Or are we trying to to catch some benefits from China. So I stop at this and ready for further discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Again, let's go to our Japanese participants. And we're very happy to see Mr. Michito, Tsuro Michito Tsuroko from Keio University. And we would be very thankful to you, Mr. Tsuroka, if you could share some comments on these key challenges that the Security Alliance faces, the alliance between Japan and the US. And I would like to hear about two things. Um, let's focus on, first thing, how satisfied you are with the first steps of Biden administration, because there were mixed perception. Um, what the administration does after Trump administration. On one hand, there are positive steps that maybe there will be more attention, less chaos, more attention to allies, more value to allies. On the other hand, we all understand that there was a certain China-related policy from Trump administration. It was rather strict, which many countries in the region liked. Uh, so what's your assessment now of the first steps of Biden administration? Uh, Mr. Ambassador said that a powerful dialogue is going on and official visits to Tokyo and uh, to Washington. So all of these things, how do you see that? in the context of Security Alliance. And after reading the comment of Mr. O'Hara, I had a strong perception that Japan doesn't feel secure enough, despite the security agreement with the US, despite the fact that they are a leading country in a number of American presence, in, among any country, and among all, all the countries is 5,000, if I'm not mistaken. 
23 military bases in Japan. So for Ukraine, it's a dream to have these things. Like they have the Article 5 in the bilateral agreement. Like in the Northern North Atlantic Alliance, they have fifth, Article 5. So all of that looks fantastic for Ukraine. But even at this situation, I have a perception that feel that Japan does not feel safe and secure enough. Does it relate to the threats, the, the new emergent threats, or is it because the changes of approach in the U.S. themselves to alliance, to ability to protect the alliance? Please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. I yeah, very much uh, look forward to, to this discussion. Uh, the, yes, uh, responding to your first question and uh, how satisfied, to what extent we are satisfied with the early days of the Biden administration. Uh, my answer is that uh, we are more or less satisfied. I think the current situation is, I think, much better than we expected before the inauguration of the Biden administration. Because initially, there were some skeptical voices in Japan regarding the policy direction of the Biden administration, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. Because the, during the Trump administration, yes, the, there were various problems, uh, lack of, lack of uh, uh, predictability and other things. But uh, still, the, the sort of a consensus, near consensus view in the foreign and security policy community in Tokyo during the Trump period was that uh, Trump is better than Obama. And that sort of understanding and discourse was there. Because the Obama administration, yes, it was the administration which started at the time called Pivot, Pivot to Asia. But the credibility and sustainability of Pivot to Asia were very much questioned at that time. So the, the people in Tokyo at that time were complaining that the uh, US was too soft on China, blah, blah, blah. And so the, for, for those people, the, Mr. Trump's very tough stance on China was a very good news. So from that perspective, the, 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 the start of the Biden administration, yes, they, there were some uh, skeptical voices, but uh, we have seen the very initial uh, phase of the Biden administration, which is quite uh, reassuring for us. Because uh, as Ambassador mentioned that uh, just a few days ago, we did a virtual Quad summit meeting. So the US, Japan, Australia, India, Quad framework, for the first time ever, we met, although virtually, but we, we met at the summit level. And uh, now, just as we speak today, the Defense Secretary Austin landed in Tokyo, and I think uh, Mr. Blinken, the Secretary of State, is also about to arrive in Tokyo. So we are going to have a two plus two meeting tomorrow. So the, and this is really a, a great sign that uh, the Biden administration attaches a great importance on, on Asia, on Japan, particularly. So the, so, so, so this, uh, what, what we have been seeing since, uh, since the inauguration of the Biden administration is quite reassuring. So that's what, uh, that, 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 that's my uh, an answer to your first question. Uh, the, but uh, feeling safe, secure or not, that's, uh, that's I think a, a deeper, bigger uh, question. Because even if you are quite satisfied with the current state of the Alliance, that doesn't mean that uh, we feel 100% safe. Not because of the lack of credibility of the US, no, that's not the case, but uh, mainly because of the threats and challenges we face in the region. So the China is there and North Korea is still there. So the, yes, the, on the one hand, the fact that the US uh, puts a great emphasis on Japan and Asia, that's a good news, but that is mainly because there are threats and challenges to be addressed. So it's not an enviable situation. I wanted to emphasize this. US pays attention to Asia because there are problems, there are challenges, there are threats. So the, yes, we very much welcome US commitment, but uh, the, 
fact that uh, there are certain challenges we have to deal with, that's not a good situation and it's not a far from enviable situation. And uh, let me say a few words uh, in addition to your questions. One is that uh, I wanted to emphasize the multifaceted, multidimensional uh, character of the US-Japan alliance. Because the, yes, the Japan-US alliance is a military alliance, but it's much more than that. That, that, that I think is quite important uh, thing because uh, we tend to focus on military cooperation, defense cooperation between the Japanese forces and the American forces. Yes, that, that is very much the pillar of the alliance, that's for sure. But uh, at the end of the day, even when real crisis happens on the US side, it's not the military leader who decides whether or not to support Japan. It is at the end of the day, the president, of course, but uh, we need to get support. We need to get uh, Congress and other politicians and American people at the end of the day. We need to get them on board. So, the, so, so, so that is why this is a political military alliance, political military alliance, and this political dimension or societal dimension, economic dimension, those are all important. So we should not focus exclusively on the, on the military side of the, the story. That's, uh, and, uh, and finally, the, as, uh, as uh, Mr. O'Hara mentioned, uh, emphasized that uh, the threat perceptions uh, we have in Japan may be from time to time quite different from those being held in the United States. But it's just a reality. It's just okay. Because uh, we, have diff we, are, we are living in a different region. So the and China threat, China challenges, yes, that we are geographically close, cl much closer to China than the US mainland is. So the, we see Chinese threats and challenges differently from those, for example, living in DC or in New York. But so the, what, what is important in alliance politics and alliance management is how we could manage the gaps, gaps in perceptions and gaps in threat perceptions. So the, the fact that there are gaps, that, that's okay. That's just a reality. But uh, we should not pretend that uh, we are united under a common 100% identical threat assessment. No, that's not the case. We should not pretend that we share everything with the United States. But what is more important is how we could, how we could manage these gaps. So, so that we, we need to be honest and uh, and then we need to talk to each other, and that's and that's exactly the, the I think the the most important element of alliance politics and alliance management. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yes, and please, all of our speakers. Um, um, thank you for staying within five minutes because we want to have um, the opportunity to have a discussion. It was not planned as a conference or round table, so very thankful to those who stick within the time limit. I would like to give floor to Pavlo Jovnirenko. We're very happy to have you in our online discussion today. Pavlo currently is also the advisor of the NSNDC, the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine. And so I have the following question to you. Over the significant time, the idea of bilateral security agreement or bilateral um, pact between Ukraine and the US is very attractive for many in Ukraine. Overall, as a model, we've seen uh, the alliances and the pacts, the agreements between the US and South Korea, US and Japan. There were several attempts even to agree with the US on the, the similar agreement. I don't know if it's gonna be a secret or not for you, but the document that was signed uh, with the US on strategic partnership the idea was to have it as a similar security agreement, but in the process of a negotiation, it boiled down to the declaration that we had. 
So could you tell us, Pavlo, currently the Japanese experience with the U.S., does it inspire us more to have this uh, security agreement or does it motivate us to look for other models of cooperation with the U.S.? What's the vision uh, of the National Security and Defense Council? If you have a comment or uh, regarding this analytics context. Thank you. So from the start, let me tell you that um, I will tell you now as a head of the Strategic Studies Center, as a think tank head, because I was not planning to speak as an advisor to NSNDC, because it's going to be more interesting for me to hear the response to this, to what I will say, and it's more easier to assess what I've heard today. So first, responding to your question regarding the bilateral agreement between the US and uh, Ukraine. You mean probably the status of a lie, of a lie outside NATO. Or did you, mean, did you mean where to go? Should Ukraine seek the status of a lie with the US outside NATO or should we be a lie of NATO? Not necessarily. It's just an agreement that uh, sees some security guarantees. So the agreement between the US and Ukraine or an entering NATO. I'm more personally um, in favor of not or or formula, but end end formula. So we have to strive towards both. Of course, for the Ukraine, the best would be NATO membership, but I'm not going to talk about the reasons why this is not going to happen in the nearest future, a year or two. It's not going to happen. So we have to strive towards both. And the third way is strengthening our own defense and resilience of Ukraine. Our homework, our main objective is to be resilient. Uh, now I would like to tell you a couple of words about what I've heard before. Uh, Mr. Bonji Ohara said that the U.S. and Japan have two uh, main aspects, is sharing information and situation awareness and perception. So listening to this uh, and hearing about the situation percep perception, this is where we see discrepancies between what Japan sees and what Ukraine has. Let's assume the Northern Territories and Crimea, Northern Territories of Japan and Crimea in Ukraine, Northern Territories in Japan and Crimea is the first analogy. And secondly, from we've just heard from Michito Soroka is that Obama was too soft for Japan and was not stringent enough towards China. The same perception in Ukraine was regarding the policy towards Russia, Ukraine, saw this, this is very soft. And this whole policy of rebooting their relations, and we didn't see it as very rational to reboot anything with Russia. Thirdly, as I heard uh, comments from um, Bonji O'Hara regarding the policy of the US towards China, I see a direct an analogy between Filipinas and electrical grids that can, is controlled by China, and Kharkiv agreements in Ukraine, and Sevastopol naval base. So different countries, Russia and China, but the methods are basically similar. Through economic stimuli, they try and get, get control over the countries that they work with. And this is where, again, 
hearing about the Chinese policy, we see analogies with the policies that were prominent some 30 years ago, but in a different direction. The China was fighting hegemonism or hegemony. Now, in the, South, in the Pacific region, now it's China pursuing the same vector that they were fighting against. They are trying to become a ruler, the dominant force in the region. So it would be interesting to hear from our esteemed Japanese colleagues, what's their view? Um, there are ways other than strengthening the defense alliance with the US, other than the efforts to strengthen their own uh, resilience and cyber, including cyber and airspace, what is their vision? Is it possible at all to effectively counter the Chinese dominance in this region? Not only by joining forces with the US, but other countries as well that are in the same region and that China wants to lay claim upon. Sincoco and Paracels, Paracels Islands, and so that would be interesting. And of course, uh, answering the question from Mr. Korsensky, are we on the outskirts or are we part of the democratic world? Of course, we should not be on outskirts. We should be part of the civilized world. Thank you, Pavlo. Okay, then uh, we'll get back to our esteemed Japanese uh, participants. Um, after we give floor to some of the Ukrainian participants, I would like to pass the floor to Hanna Hopko, who is part of the network um, Defense of Natural Interest, ANS. And before she was head of the Committee of Foreign Affairs in the parliament, she visited uh, Japan, she knows the Japanese context, Japanese American context. So Anna, What's your uh, view on how relevant this experience is of a Japanese American uh, alliance? How relevant it is for Ukraine? Thank you, Alona. Can you hear me? Hello. We was chewing a talk. Ah, chew it, it's a Мене половина чує, половина не чує, так? А зараз чути? We're still testing the sound. Зараз мене чути? We have some technical difficulties with the channels. Перекладач чує. Well, we'll probably switch to a different speaker while we're resolving this technical issue. Alexei, can you hear me? Yeah. Alongside, uh, I would like to greet everybody and thank the organizers. And uh, thank uh, Bonji O'Hara for a very uh, interesting intervention. I would like to dwell on some important aspects. So if we talk about similarities or differences between Japan and Ukraine, characteristics of the security. I would like to talk about different nuances.
So we talk about neighborhood with the great state, which is what Japan shares with Ukraine. Neighboring with big state that has territorial claims, that has some historic phantom pains. It's a constant threat for national security of both countries. We can, well, we can see that China or Russia is a threat for us, but different character of these threats. What I also liked uh, with what Mr. O'Hara said is that the nuance of hybrid threats, which comes not only from Russia, but from China. When they use the tactics that is called short of war or below Article 5. But it's a tactic that severely limits the implementation of bilateral agreements. Also, regarding the, the shared threats, surprising as it is, but Ukraine and Japan in the world hierarchy are in the same weight category in terms oh well, of course economic potential is hugely different but we both cannot be regarded as superpowers so for countries like that it's crucial to have an alliance with bigger or more uh, powerful ally allies and through that to achieve the balance of power i share completely the approaches of japan outlined in the defense strategy and other documents so first of all counting on their own power and the de defense so strengthening their own defense and resilience and secondly is having an alliance japanese us alliance and thirdly international cooperation that is, what, that is something that is contained in Ukrainian strategic documents, but we have not formalized yet the Ukrainian-American uh, alliance. We have strategic partnership. And in the context of the key uh, advices, I'd like to say that in this situation, we should not focus too much on formal parts. We should focus on the quality of this alliance, the quality of these relations. In theory of international relations there are no direct recommendations other more downsides or benefits when a country enters into alliance the only recommendation is that those who pass this decision or those who implement this policy they should look into the theory because uh, the benefits are clear it's very interesting, but there are a lot of shortcomings, limitations, and commitments that the country takes upon itself by entering into a coalition or alliance and uh, security agreements with a, with a different partner. Also, in Mr. O'Hara's uh, intervention, we it was mentioned the gray zone. We um, interpret gray zone a little differently. And gray zone of security is the period where we are now as Ukraine. And by the time when Ukraine will sign more serious security agreements with NATO or the US. Another nuance that Ukraine has to think about is that Ukraine, what Ukraine can offer to its ally because Japan, uh, and it's very clear, and it was mentioned what U Ukraine can offer, what Ukraine, what, what Japan can offer, what Ukraine can offer, not only in terms of cross-national support, but in other diplomatic economic spheres, that's a different picture completely. And finally, I'd like to refer to some of the theoretical knowledge there's a well-known saying countries don't have constant allies or enemies there are only constant interests either henry kissinger said that or henry temple 
But in this case, we see a very unique example where an alliance that was signed between the US and Japan in, back in the 50s is so long, is so long lasting that it's, it proves that if you choose a pro proper ally, if you build proper relations, this alliance can be a very long lasting alliance and keep your interest uh, under protection. Thank you. Hanno, you are hopefully now with us. Can you hear me now? Англійський канал вас чує. Вам треба відімкнути оригінальний звук. Там є така опція. А тепер мене чути? А зараз теж чути? Зараз перекладач теж чує. Чуєте, якою мовою? Зараз якою мовою? Okay, one more time we'll we'll ask Anna to pass the floor to a different speaker. Natalia Butirska, thank you for joining us. In she uh, is an expert in Eastern Southeastern Asia. Maybe you have you know or you would you'd like to say something that has not been covered yet uh, or something important in this context. Thank you. It's um, very pleasant that thanks to your center, thanks to your efforts, the uh, attention to Asian region is stronger and stronger. Because to see right now the problems of Asia and Europe separately, we can't see it separately anymore. As colleagues said, we see Russia as a threat. Asian region and Japan in particular sees China as a threat. But as was said before, the character of these threats of these countries is similar. And the approaches and the aggressive action that they're using towards their neighbors is also similar. So if we don't respond now, the world order can be shifted very, very profoundly. And the goals that we pursued before will be on the background. So. We've managed to see how the presence of uh, healthy international leadership plays a negative role during the pandemic or the absence of the leadership where each country is for themselves. Now, we see this vaccine chaos that gives a lot of inequality where some countries dominate, other countries are at a loss. Now, when we talk about Japan, you were correct uh, to say that Japan, despite the alliance with the US, despite their economic uh, power and technological power, they don't feel 100% safe. In order to feel safe, there are a lot of initiatives. And I would like to dwell on these economic, uh, these efforts of Japan so that um, Ukraine could borrow some of this. So the example of Japan shows that the country itself pays a lot of effort to support the alliance. And so that the US have an active interest in maintaining it. So what does it mean? It means 
building our own resilience. When Russian aggression started in Ukraine and Ukraine started talking to allies and thinking that somebody will resolve their interest, their problems with Russia, the allies said, we are ready to support you, but you yourself have to learn to protect yourself. And this rule is uh, the same rule for Japan. And Japan pays a lot of attention to strengthening their own defense and resilience, but at the same time, uh, in Ukraine, there's still a lot of um, clashes. Our internal, our people, and like uh, we've seen that the Prime Minister Abe could not change the uh, Article 9 of Constitution because within the country there are different uh, sentiments, different understanding of the situation. Similarly, neighbor countries and some uh, circles in the US. We're never, we're not, not always positive to, when they saw as Japan tries to build their own uh, resilience and defense. And they, <clears throat> through sometimes <clears throat> complaints against Japan. So we have, they have to convince their own people that, we, that they do have to respond to the existing threats. Next, what I would like to say is Proper identification of threats and proper response to the threats. Because the Asian policy uh, of the US has been shifting, has been changing. There were periods where there was more interest, there were periods with less interest, whether they focused more on Near East or Middle East. <clears throat> and so Japan has to pay a lot of effort to convince the US that Asian region, just as before, requires attention from the US, their presence, their active presence and active cooperation, especially it was, it was felt during the Donald Trump administration. Next, initiative. Because Indian and Pacific strategy is suggested by Shinzo Abe back in 2007. But it wasn't supported largely. And only after that, after the second term, he started gradually to push this initiative. And now it's relevant in the US, not only US, but others have uh, supported the strategy. And now they, it's their support. And just like in 2004, uh, how widespread it became in 2007 when Shinzo Abe tried to return to this dialogue, the security dialogue, India and Australia were very cautious about this initiative. And for 10 years, it stopped to exist. But this initiative of Japan, this consequential um, perseverance of Japan is a great example how to push through an important initiative. Next, creating partnership networks. So um, by residing and having an alliance with the US, Japan ne never stops talking to other allies, focusing their attention on the problems in the region and trying to balance the Chinese threat. And Australia, India, and OSEAN countries are an important uh, circle of partners. And let's talk about Ukraine again. Uh, despite the Russian aggression, despite the fact that our neighbors have similar problems like Moldova and uh, Georgia, we could not yet build this sufficient influence in a uh, partnership to somehow have a shared front to respond to Russian threat, to, to build this consensus that Russia is an aggressor. Japan managed to do that with their neighbors because they were playing the long game. 
And if we think that India and Australia are very satisfied uh, or agree all the time with their Japanese initiative, no, they are not always. They do have trade relations with China and Australia that has moved a little bit aside uh, when they talked about pandemic origins, they received the trade war. India has a conflict with China on the border and, and this conflict the, lays a certain trend, like India tries to soften this situation and it's hard for Japan to convince them. Thank you. Um, we are running out of time, unfortunately. So I would like to have some feedback from um, Ambassador, from Mr. O'Hara. So let's try again to have Hannah Hopko with us. Hanna, now you can summarize what you've heard for yourself within five minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you, Alona. Thank you, Nova Europa Center, for starting a very professional discussion of Asian strategy and the role of uh, Ukraine. And we have quite a practical discussion now which is very relevant. American Security Alliance, why is it relevant? After reading the analytical um, note, where a steam expert scrutinizes the scenario of China capturing Senkaku Islands, how China using their whole arsenal of hybrid warfare now in the modern world with cyber attacks, disinformation, different special operations, that reminds us very much of uh, the hybrid warfare Russia against uh, Ukraine. And on the black backdrop of nuclearization, militarization of temporarily occupied Crimea, we see how <clears throat> Russia is an absolutely unstoppable, unconvincible um, force that tries to control the Black Sea region. Uh, like a Russian lake. And here, by doing so, creating threats for mm, Mediterranean. Even having Article 5 and the agreement with Japan, um, Ukraine having military aggression has to learn something that the Budapest memorandum at the guarantees that we were counting on were not fulfilled for us. So the US did not do as promised in the Budapest memorandum. And we did lose Crimea. So Russia and China have their own ambition and they pursue their own economic expansion um, by force. Of course, we would like to see more effective coordination in this concept of free and open Indian Pacific region to have um, a scenario for the future, how to avoid the situation <clears throat> with Russian aggression, which has been there for eight years now. For Ukraine, it's obvious that the deepening of strategic partnership with the US and gaining the status of ally is one of the important tasks um, as we have in the constitution, the Euro-Atlantic vector and membership in the NATO and EU in our constitution. And it's great that we have uh, Asian strategy now, which is, uh, which is not replacing the European strategy. It's not a signal that we are declaring the move to EU or NATO. No, it's Asian strategy helps us build and send strict signals that Ukraine wants to be not only in the sphere of others' interests, but to become 
more a player for Eastern partnership and post-Soviet space. And in this aspect, it's great that we and the coalition of civil organization and analytical centers were planning to have on the 7th and 8th um, uh, June, big international doc conference, democracy in action, future without corruption, with stress on new threats to democracy, among them disinformation, um, nihilism, and strategic corruption, where authoritative states use corruption to strengthen their own geopolitical influence. And we would like to very much to see representatives of Japan on this important international conference in June to talk about how to protect the international agenda, the values, respect to international law, the rule of law. And of course, here, Ukraine is usually, um, as Nova Europa has laid out, Ukraine is a soft power in the region. And all of our Euro-Atlantic uh, aspirations, they also are certain signals to those countries where now there's a fight going on for democracy. Belarus, uh, Russia itself. So for Japan, in their own European strategy, Ukraine is the foundation, not only in, in uh, deterrence of Russian aggression, but also in the ag agenda center and trend center in terms of democracy. And of course, I, I think that U Ukrainian unique experience in countering military aggression, um, hybrid threats, cyber threats can be a contributor. And Russian crypto war that they're doing, the, that they're using church, analytical think tanks attempting to control the country through their own agents. So I think those responses that Ukraine continues to do, we have to talk about this in the 21st century. And I think that the fact that we're trying to restore our relations with the US and counting to have together with Georgia some preferences. So I think that will be the step forward where Ukraine will be perceived as a partner, partner for NATO countries and prospective NATO member and also for Japan. And I would agree with uh, Ambassador that it's important for us to put the, to resolve this issue with Motor Siege and all these sensitive areas in high tech. Ukraine has to have the geopolitical understanding of global threats, not to talk only about trade. Because we've seen attempts to of uh, European Union to somehow convince China through trade. No, it didn't work. It led to even bigger expansion of China. So it's time for those who think about democracy to finally act. And thank you. Okay, I have a question to everybody in Tokyo today. To Dr. O'Hara to Professor Turoki and uh, Sergei Korsunsky. To what extent is there an interest in Japan towards uh, US relations toward Ukraine? Something that is as a shared interest for Japan and Ukraine. It's restoring international law after the Crimean annexation how adequate do you think the response of the US was regarding the Crimean annexation and regarding the Sinkako claims that blue uh, unnamed soldiers pop out there, just like green unnamed soldiers were popping up in Crimea? 
So is there a lesson learned in Japan regarding Budapest Memorandum, the U.S. promise to protect the sovereignty and failing to fulfill it? So regarding the North Korea, that is another huge concern. And what's the perception in Japan? So what are the lessons learned? Are there any lessons learned uh, from Ukraine in Japan? Dr. Oharo. Yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, uh, I think there are two aspects. Sorry? It's okay. Continue, okay. please. Uh, there are two aspects, I think. The uh, first one is the uh, there are two different situations in East and West. And uh, Russia and China are playing different games in the East and the West. And uh, Russia uh, shows the uh, uh, aggressive posture uh, in the West, but not so much in the East. But China uh, shows the aggressive posture sometimes in the East, but smiling to West. But uh, this is not only the uh, regional problem. Then uh, uh, we need to uh, deal with the issues and uh, deal with the uh, uh, countries uh, from both sides uh, of East and West, I think. And uh, how to connect the, uh, uh, these uh, issues uh, or the, uh, connect the East and the West? The United States uh, must be the uh, key. Then uh, originally, the uh, uh, structure of the alliance with United States uh, was so-called uh, hub and spoke. But uh, now the, uh, we are trying to uh, change the structure from hub and spoke to the uh, network. It means the uh, Japan also need to uh, cooperate with other allies of the United States. And uh, one another aspect is the uh, issues are not only in the uh, uh, physical domain, and uh, cyberspace and also in the uh, outer space. Uh, it does not have border, but uh, uh, it also concerns the uh, many activities in the gray zone. And, uh, so uh, we cannot separate the uh, uh, region to region, and also the, uh, we cannot separate the uh, uh, cyberspace to uh, uh, outer space and the uh, real world. And, uh, also, the, uh, we cannot separate uh, between uh, peacetime, gray zone, and uh, wartime. So uh, we need to uh, cooperate from uh, peacetime, as I mentioned. And, uh, but uh, each country has also each situation. And, uh, Japan uh, cannot use the uh, uh, self-defense force uh, in the uh, uh, gray zone or peacetime as a military forces. But uh, still, oh, Japan still has the uh, 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 items to cooperate with the United States, uh, even in a peacetime. Uh, and also, uh, in the gray zone must be difficult to uh, deal with issues. But, uh, we are, uh, started uh, discussing about the uh, cooperation in the gray zone. And the uh, implication of the uh, US-Japan alliance uh, was changing, uh, as I said, and uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, posed the uh, uh, implication uh, of the uh, uh, Japan-US alliance as a uh, global commons. The, uh, Prime Minister Abe raised the uh, concept of uh, proactive uh, contribution to peace. Uh, it means the uh, Japan, uh, it, he uh, tried to change the uh, uh, Japan-US alliance to from the uh, uh, alliance to for the uh, defense of Japan to the uh, uh, alliance to uh, keep the uh, peace and the stability condition in the uh, region and also in the uh, international society. So uh, in this uh, concept, the, uh, Japan and the European countries uh, must cooperate to uh, uh, deal with uh, issues and global issues, and also the issues in the cyberspace. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank, I've, I've been enjoying this discussion thoroughly. I'd like to thank all the participants and uh, all of our attendees. I'd like to respond to your question, how Ukrainian experience is perceived from Japan. Let me tell you, there's a little bit of an error that we have to distinguish. Distinct, distinguish. The, China, the Crimean question is not equal to Senkaku uh, issue. We were talking about Northern Territories and there's an occupation and the occupant country doesn't, doesn't even negotiate and people were resettled and the military base was built in Crimea. And so, so in Senkaku, there are claims um, to, to deteriorate the sovereignty. And it is, it, it can lead to military conflict because Japan will never allow the Chinese troops landing on these islands. It's nobody's living there, but it can happen theoretically. And it's gonna be a military conflict. So there are different aspects here. And of course, for Japan, these issues, and for the US, of course, is the shared position. <clears throat> but it's also about international law. Japan maintains two principles. First of all, freedom of uh, maritime navigation. And secondly, no changes of borders. So these two principles, they are uh, in the foundation of any decision regarding the UN or international multilateral uh, agreements. and. That's very important because for Japan, it's a pivotal position. They are doing everything possible to resolve the issue in a peaceful way without escalating the conflict to a military grade. To make the maximum as, we, as, we, as they can through negotiation regarding Russia and China, because for, because, uh, for Japan and for Australia and for Ukraine, China is a trade partner. So it's a big distinction that economy is a tool of soft power. Nobody's, nobody's uh, calling to break re relations with China, but alongside with trade relations, <clears throat> there's strengthening of uh, security by any means within the constitution and the powers that it grants and using the partnership with the US that the US is ready to maintain. But understanding that it's not enough to have two countries here, that's why they have four, um, the quartet format. And you will probably see additional initiatives to that. There's ASEAN countries, there are many other things that are very important in that region. So on one hand, our experience and attempts to peaceful settling of issues where the Donbass and Crimea, Japan knows that. And I think they scrutinize it. And I think that they will also consider that because they, they see our efforts and attempts to peaceful settling in the Donbass. And you know it, it doesn't lead to any peace and it makes it obvious that this, the same is going to be happening in regarding the Northern Territories. As Putin said recently, we're ready to re develop Japanese relations, but we'll do nothing that breaks the constitution of Russia. And the Russian constitution, as you know, is, is it's a criminal crime, it's a criminal offense to even talk about changing of borders. Okay, thank you. Professor Tsuroki, um, I would like to add to the question from the viewers. What the Japanese attendees think are the most effective methods to influence Russia in order to return the occupied territories? Are there any 
uh, things in the poll in the Japanese uh, U.S. activities to counter Russian aggression. So, has Japan found any effective methods? Um, to counter Russian aggression. So your ideas, how to return the territories they captured? Are there any programs between the US and Japan to counter hybrid aggression? And um, Mr. Ambassador said interesting things. Sinkaku, in the perception of um, Japanese, or oh, uh, sorry, Crimea in the Japanese perception. Is it closer to Sinkaku or is it Northern Territories? Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for interesting set of questions. Uh, and first on the Crimea comparison with Senkaku and Northern Territories, I, I'm, I'm quite sure that a uh, better comparison would be between Crimea and uh, Northern Territories because they, because they, they, as for Senkaku, Japan controls the islands. So the, our job there in the East China Sea uh, regarding Senkaku is quite straightforward because our job is to is to maintain the status quo, so prevent the Chinese from taking the islands. So the but as for northern territories, yes, we believe that uh, it's part of Japan and uh, we have sovereignty over those islands. But uh, the reality is that Russia controls everything, so the Russians are living there and even military bases are there. So the so it's a it's a it's a it's sort of a seized uh, territory from a Japanese perspective, and it's it's exactly like uh, what happened uh, in 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 the Crimea. So the yeah yes the as for the we we have been uh, closely following what uh, the Americans have been dealing with the situation in Ukraine and crisis in Ukraine, and uh, for, from our perspective, what what is the most important is, is, to, is to maintain a principled position. So that, that is quite important. So the yes, that we know that uh, it's uh, highly unlikely for Russians to return Crimea, very sorry. But uh, at the same time, it's uh, highly likely, we, we know that uh, it's highly unlikely for, for Russia to return Northern Territories to Japan anytime soon. So the, it's, it's really difficult. But uh, what is important is, is for us to keep talking, keep raising this issue, keep pushing this and keep raising this issue, not just uh, in the bilateral context, but also in the multilateral context as well. So wherever possible, we, we need to keep talking about these issues because the maintaining principled position based on international law, that is always, always important because if we stop talking about these issues, then the nothing will happen. So that's uh, my first point. And, uh, and secondly, in terms of influencing Russia, I, to be quite honest, I'm not quite optimistic about the, about the prospect of uh, Russians to, to change its position uh, regarding the Northern Territory issues. Uh, but uh, at least the, the, what is needed, what is indispensable is to get Americans on board. Th that is quite indispensable because uh, particularly given the fact that uh, Japan is an ally of the United States. So they're seen from Russia. Japan is uh, very much part of the US alliance network. So that as long as the US Russia relationship is bad and tense, then the nothing will happen. So just uh, <clears throat> remember when, the, when two Germanys got united in 1990, at the time, the, yes, the US-Soviet relationship was very good and the US was fully behind German wish to get united. So, the, so the, that, that was why the, the George H.W. Bush administration did, tried very hard to get German unification done. And also it was done in the context of NATO. So the, but, uh, the lessons we, we learned from that experience is that uh, for for, for us to, to persuade Russians, yes, there we need to get uh, Americans on board and also the Americans need to reassure Russians that uh, allowing German unification is in Russia's interest, the Soviet interest at the time. And that, that's sort of a, a, 
a, a, a dimension it is needed. But uh, for the moment, I, I don't really think that the Americans are fully on board in, in the course of Japan's efforts to, to get Northern Ireland back. So the, we, I think uh, we, we need more discussions between Japanese and Americans before talking to Russians, that's, uh, that's what I believe. And uh, uh, one more point is, is about uh, the yes, and hybrid and uh, gray zone uh, things, like what happened in the Crimea. The, the, one of the biggest lessons or generic lessons we have learned from the Crimea experience is that uh, what is the most important, most important thing is to prevent Russians or Chinese from changing the status quo. So we need to act before they change the status quo on the ground. Because after, once the change is done, then the, it will be really, really much, much, much more difficult to regain the seized territories. So the, we need to act beforehand in advance of their efforts to change the status quo uh, on the ground. And uh, so that, that, that is why uh, the how to deal with Senkaku issues for Japan is really important because the situation is that uh, Japan still controls those islands and China is challenging Japanese control. So the, our job is stay straightforward. We need to maintain the status quo. So the, our sort of nightmare is that uh, one day when we wake up and then we find Chinese uh, militia type of people on the islands. And that, that sort of situation is going to be really difficult for us to deal with. So that is why we need to prevent that from happening. So the, yeah, so, so, so the, that, that is, I think, one of the biggest lessons from the Crimea case. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Taroka. Although um, it is not a very optimistic note, but uh, we would very much like to wish our Japanese partner to avoid the Crimean scenario uh, for the Japanese to be successful in their preventive steps so that there will never be a new Crimea in terms of uh, annexation. And I think uh, Ukrainian partners are ready to share experience and political support and support in other important things. So, so once again, Thank you very much to everybody for the discussion. We had uh, quite a lot of attendees and speakers for this short time. Very sorry if there are uh, those who wanted to speak, but no, no time. We have two other online discussions this week between Ukraine and Japan after tomorrow in, on Wednesday, how to rebrand Ukraine in Japan and reciprocally Japan in Ukraine with analytical comments from one of the experts. And on Friday, we will also talk about the free trade zones that Ukraine has with the EU and Japan has with the EU. And when can this gray zone appear between Ukraine and Japan? Uh, or how to unite all these zones, all this free trade to work more effectively and to trade more effectively and to have friend relations and all kinds of exchanges so thanks to everyone for having found time and see you next time hopefully not only online somewhere down the line in the future thank you so much and have the great rest of the day thank you very much thank you bye-bye thank you bye